Join us Sunday, April 12th at Hemingbow for the Easter Sunrise Service.
Hallelujah, Christ is risen. The Lord is risen indeed. Hallelujah, hallelujah. And what a great gift it is to have sound. <laughs> <laughs> hallelujah. Christ is risen. Christ is risen indeed. Hallelujah. Uh, to be here together and to join in prayer. Uh, if you're able, please stand now for our prayer. <laughs> Lord Jesus Christ, you have risen, and we see that this tomb is empty, and we know again, Lord Jesus, your power and life. Lord God, for this moment in time, for the beauty of song, for the power of the reading of your word, for the wonder of a message of, of good news, of forgiveness of sins, of death that is dead and life that is made new, we give you great praise, Lord Jesus. And we ask, God, that in this day, we would not just believe that we would move belief into action that we would show again the power of the resurrection that we would live into the resurrection that you've given us Lord Jesus for this time and for your people in this place of different skin color of different language to know again that you have moved all of us as sisters and brothers in you your children Lord God thank you Jesus Christ our Savior for the miracle of the resurrection now move in us by the power of your spirit in the name of Christ Jesus, our resurrected Savior, we pray. Amen.
to sing now. I will cherish the old rugged cross where my trophies at last I lay down. I will cling to the old rugged cross. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. <laughs> thank you, thank you, thank you. Well, what do you say after that? <laughs> I don't even need a microphone. You see? <laughs> thank you all so, so much for coming. And let me just say that of all of us here, it's not about us. It's about you and your relationship with Jesus Christ. Amen. So, if you want to clap, you want to do whatever it can, seems natural. Is that okay, Brother Jay? <laughs> and, uh, you know, this is just the most wonderful morning of the year, isn't it? Amen. This is the morning where everything was joyful and there was nothing but great news that Jesus Christ has risen and he lives within our hearts. Amen. So, uh, as you can see, we have quite a bit of talent on this on this stage. And uh, can we start with the preacher first? <laughs> <laughs> now, this guy, when I heard that he was going to be the new pastor at University Baptist Church, I looked at all his degrees. Now, I have that printed, if anybody doubts, and uh, doctor, 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 so I thought, well, now, boy, we're going to have to have great respect, and uh, doctor, you know, and then I shook hands with him, and he said, just call me Jay, so uh, Dr. Jay, we are very, very glad to have you, and uh, then this fellow over here. Uh, I met him about uh, five or six years ago, and uh, Thomas Dawson, he's been with the Commodores, he's been the keyboardist for how many years? Eighteen. So it's so wonderful to have uh, Thomas here and his brother, Ken. Okay? So, uh, and... Keith. <laughs> And this, and this lady here is a very, very special, dear person to me. Uh, when my parents were ill, uh, a wonderful nurse was kneeling or sitting by my mother's bed singing to my mother about uh, three days before she made her transition. And uh, <coughs> she's, she's with the with Jesus for sure right now. And so I said, Ollie, and uh, she is the most incredible person. 
not only when she sings with that spirit, but she lives with that spirit. And it takes a very, very special person to do what you do on a daily basis, taking care of those that are needing that little assistance in making their transition to the other side. And then Nikki, and we love <laughs> And then Nikki Cage, if you call Hemingbow on, a, on Monday through Fridays and sometimes on Saturdays and sometimes on Sundays, you will meet, you will speak with Nikki. So, uh, uh, and Nikki uh, has very graciously uh, said that she would sing a solo for us. And uh, she goes to Afton Villa Baptist Church where she sings in the choir. And uh, it's just wonderful to have you, Nikki, here with us today. And thank you all so much for being here. And uh, we love you. For those that uh, have not been here before, uh, the grounds of Hemingbow are always open 24 hours a day for you. It's about when you need some time to spend with yourself and your relationship with Christ. So if you want to come and you just need that special place, uh, whether it be a sunrise or a sunset, always feel that you have a place right here at Hemingbow. Now you may see some big iron gates up there and they may be closed. But right beside those gates, there's a four-foot opening. Now, we should have a sign, trespassing permitted. <laughs> but uh, we can get around to that one day. But you, that's your sign saying, please come any time that you feel like you need. Bring, bring that loved one, bring in, or just come along. We love you, and thank you for coming. And... Uh, I want to see every one of you back next year. Okay? Thank you so much.
proven that you're not ashamed. You have come here for Jesus Christ, and I'm proud of you. We're an anchor for those who are hurting. We're a harbor for those who are so lost. But sometimes I know it's not easy bearing Calvary's cross. We've been ridiculed by those who don't know him and mocked by those who don't believe Still I love standing up for my Jesus Cause of all that he's done for me That's why I'm not ashamed of the gospel The gospel of Jesus Too much behind. 
a sense of anguish, a sense of loss, a sense of pain. Both the sounds of exhaustion and grief come tumbling out of Mary Magdalene. The first sound, that, that deep breath that all of us need, but so rarely we take. Before you yell at the kids, before you honk your horn, before you mutter under your breath, that breath, that catch. She pounds out after losing losing the race. You, you heard in the story that Peter and the other disciple, the one whom Jesus loved, have, have raced past her. Making a beeline to the tomb, they're wide-eyed and disbelieving at first. Disbelieving. Not faithful yet. These two, these two guys, if you can imagine, don't stop to ask for directions. Especially not from Mary Magdalene. It, it figures, not from her. Her credibility is, uh, is questionable anyway, after all. It, it, it seems that they, they've heard her words, and they're words that they, they would have never expected. You can imagine Mary Magdalene coming to, to their hideout where they're, where they're tucked away in fear. Jesus, he's not there. His tomb, it's empty. She gasps. And before any other word heaves out of her dry mouth, they blast out that door. So the pace, at first, when you hear it, is, is frantic. These, these two, Peter and the other disciple, they, they run past her, past Mary to the tomb, and mainly to see. No matter what other motivations they have, Peter probably seeking redemption because he's, he's so messed up. He's so, he's so turned his back on Jesus. We know in the stories. And the other disciple whom Jesus loved, possibly John, out of pure love for Jesus, expecting and hoping but, but surely not believing yet, and it's in that moment when they get there to that empty tomb that, that it must be like a, it must be like Christmas morning for a four-year-old. That sense of of one one big long look, and then in the next moment it's it's a million blinks. You hear in the story in a whirlwind they look, they enter, they see, they believe, then leave. That quick. In their wake, instead of wrapping paper lying strewn across the floor, they see these linen cloths neatly folded in the corner, which is the surest sign that death is dead. <clears throat> death is defeated, pushed back, tucked into a dark corner. As soon as those two get there, saw for themselves, believed, and off they go, running back the way that they came, here comes Mary. And the first shall be last, and the last shall be first. Didn't he say something like that? Before the beatings and the blood, before the suffering and the cross, he... He, he said, and the last shall be first. And here comes Mary. All she's known in her life is last. And Jesus' ministry assured her and all of us that slow, slow does not mean stupid. I heard these words from a friend the other day. How greatly I need these words how much they apply to this story that slow is never meant stupid. Now Mary, Mary might be slow, but she ain't stupid. And she gets there, she finally gets there to the grave after Peter and the other disciple whom Jesus loved have, have blitzed past her already seeing what she's about to see. And we realize that slow doesn't mean stupid because she's the only one left in that cemetery. Cemetery Mary. So she's standing there, and, and while she might not be as fast as the other ones, and she might not run as fast, in, in God's time, slow sometimes is just right. Slow doesn't mean stupid. Because Mary, instead of the other two who, who run around in a million blinks before their very eyes, they're there and gone, Mary stays there. She's the first one who's left alone, the first one who has to deal with the grief of the empty tomb. Alone. So she's there. 
And I wonder how many times Mary Magdalene had to face that sense of being last in her life. You know the stories on Mary. But before the humiliation of losing some foot race to, to Peter and the other one, you hear the, the days in her life where the crowds, the crowds would look at her with that, that sideways glance, you know? Maybe you've received them occasionally. Your daughter gets pregnant before she's married. Now, it's, it's hell being the one who, who receives a sideways glance, but sisters and brothers, sometimes we're the ones who, who give the sideways glance. The look down the nose. Mm. You? Mm-mm. There were days when Mary receives this. The gospel says she struggled. Luke tells us in the stories that, that she was possessed by seven demons that were released. The, the tradition whispers to us that Mary, Mary's, Mary's the one who's the prostitute. Before it was cool. The sad thing is, it's never been cool, is it? She was, she was used for others' pleasure, left with none of her own. Not until Jesus came and turned Mary's life around. And maybe that's her first sound then, at this tomb, is this, this heave. This sense of it. Of, of trying to catch her breath as she stands there in grief in a world that in a world that rushes around us to be first to achieve more to accomplish everything at one time this is the first lesson from this tomb we learned this much at the empty tomb slow down in the name of Jesus Christ slow down don't miss this miracle don't miss the miracle of your life. The life granted us by this empty tomb. Slow down. Being busy, Lord knows, being busy does not mean being important. But sweet Jesus, how many times during a week do I fake it that way? I'm busy, Lord, I'm busy. I'm busy. Not Mary. Every one of us needs to just catch our breath. The last shall be first. Slow doesn't mean stupid. The thing is, Mary's not, not left behind. Instead, she's left to find what the others have missed in their haste. If Mary's left to wait, then sometimes waiting... Lord, this is hard. Sometimes waiting is the best way God works in our life. I don't like the sound of that either. When Mary is helpless to do anything else on her own, when she's, she's tired from all the running back and forth and, and left with no other options than to sit and wait, she's finally left with nothing else to lean on and no one else to count on. Then, when your child is sick in the middle of the night, when your job is miserable because your boss is a jerk, when you hear the doctor say it's cancer and your world caves in. When your friend keeps making the worst possible decisions and you've offered her all the help you can. Helpless, hurting, and finally still. At such times, the truth, the painful truth, might be the feeling of helplessness can sometimes be so helpful. No wonder the, the world is still dark at that tomb and Mary Magdalene is the last one there because sometimes you have to know something of the dark before you can ever appreciate the sunshine. And sometimes you and I, we have to hear death breathing down our neck before we ever appreciate the whisper of life in our ears. When you're helpless, you're finally open to being helped. And the, tr the truth is here that Easter is the last thing she expected. And Easter might be the last thing you're expecting today. But the last shall be first. By waiting, 
Mary had to look through her tears, yes, but by waiting she sees through her tears more clearly than she'd ever see otherwise. Why are you crying? That's the first of two questions we get in this gospel scene. The angels ask first, <laughs> why am I crying? This is a graveyard, and I'm standing in between headstones and bouquets. Don't you think Mary Magdalene might have wanted to answer in that way? I'm sitting here in the dark by an empty tomb. Isn't this the perfect place to wait? You know? Helpless, weeping, waiting. Mary should have at least had the full pause for pity. And this is, this is the second sound she makes. The second heave. It's, it's simpler. It's that of a whimper. A whimper of grief. In this scene, though, there's more to, there's more to grief than meets the ear at first. Mary weeps the, the natural flow of grief, but that natural flow of grief is interrupted. The body she wants to prepare has gone missing. It's a cruel joke, she figures, right? How many of us know that feeling? That sense of a cruel joke that we, we don't have enough time to grieve one loss because another one comes ripping right through us. I remember when I was growing up in Birmingham. <laughs> it was a stretch of time there where, where our Wamaraner, a dog, big gray dog, Wamaraner, Josh, his first dog I ever owned, Josh, died. Then my best friend moved. Then my parents divorced. I cannot remember how long it took for all of those losses to happen. But loss it seems to happen too fast every time. And grief seems to linger too long every time. And maybe there are those of us, on the other hand, who don't ever give ourselves enough time to grieve. You know, keep up appearances. <laughs> You have to show the strong exterior. So then we're left with the inside joke that only we are in on, that after everybody has left the graveside, that after all the casseroles have gone away, after everybody has left the house for the night, it's then that the tears dot your face like stars dot the night sky. It's the next question that spins Mary for, for a real loop that turns her all around. It's a question she hears, is it from Jesus or the gardener? Whom are you looking for? Second question. Mary's all turned around now. At first she sees, she sees this complete stranger. It's, it's a gardener, isn't it? First. That's who she thinks it is. Mary's no stranger to strangers. She's taken them in all her life, I think. She turns her first of two turns here. This is where the miracle comes. She's, she's halfway there to the truth now. Whom are you looking for? She, she turns and she just, she just wants the truth. So she says, just tell me where you've taken the body. It's, it's okay. I'll handle it from there. It's the very next sound that rips open grief and punctures the darkness and tears open the tomb with love and life and light. It's, it's the sound of her name. Mary. He's calling her name like he calls yours and mine. Mary. Mary. And this is the gospel truth, the sound of the gospel. Because we know in John's gospel that Jesus calls all of his sheep by their name. We know the truth of the gospel in John is that he is the good shepherd. Jesus Christ is the good shepherd. And the sheep follow his voice. And he calls them by name. So Mary now finally firm, turns her, her full attention. She turns the second turn to her full attention to Jesus. And it's the sound of the gospel that turns everything around in our life. It's a sound that works this way, once the turn for recognition, twice the turn for redirection. And here's the lesson of the gospel story for me. In Mary, we see our own need 
to turn to Jesus. In this gospel story, the resurrection and the empty tomb where Jesus is alive, we see that we, like Mary, need to present our life fully to Jesus Christ. Mary shows us the first turn, the recognition of life over death, of his promise over the pain of death, of the recognition of surprise, the turn of, of recognition to the amazing grace that we have to stop. Take a breath. A redirection. This is the harder part of it, isn't it? Something completely new has crashed in the world and turned the world upside down. We recognize it, but we also then redirect our life to it. This is where the work comes. For this reason, the gospel story shares the hardest part of the scene, I think. It's, it's past Mary crying. It's in the recognition of Jesus in the redirection of her life. Just when I want Jesus to give Mary the, the long embrace in the tearful hug. I, I, I want Jesus to invite Mary Magdalene to gather the disciples and say something like, let's, let's go slice the ham. Let's go put on a potato salad. And then we'll finish this meal with a nice strawberry cake, right? That's what I want Jesus to say. Let's go home. Gather them up. We we'll eat good. We'll take a nap. Instead, the hard part is he tells you the truth. You know, the truth is this. Don't cling to me. It's not what I'm expecting. Well, Mary cannot keep holding on to Jesus. She can rest in the truth that Jesus will keep holding on to her. You see, Easter has changed everything. And by the resurrection, things just don't stay the same. Jesus is no longer just her rabuni, her teacher. Jesus is, is Lord. The Christ who's risen from the dead. This goes to show that, that no matter how much we want to hold on to the old comfortable Jesus, you know, the one that I learned about in third grade with the felt board in Sunday school, the, the one that's much more comfortable for me, the one that I can wrap my arms around and wrap my mind around, no matter how much I want to hold on to this Jesus, this one I can stick right there, Jesus will slip away. The truth is, He will give us new ways to see Him. Jesus will give us a, a new challenge to accept His grace again. You understand our Savior cannot be pinned down to our expectations. It's like, it's like trying to put a hurricane in a jar, I suppose. Yeah. Jesus has to grow up in our lives. Jesus has to grow up in our lives and shatter our small, <coughs> frail, human attempts to keep Him in our clutches. This is not easy. But to redirect our life means you cannot stuff Jesus back in that tomb. Jesus won't stay there. That means it takes faith to see He is risen to life, but it takes faith to follow Him through life. You cannot stuff Jesus back into that tomb. This is Craig Barnes, a wonderful preacher and Presbyterian minister, has said, even we Baptists can read Presbyterian stuff, I guess. The brother says, Following Jesus is a never-ending process of losing Him the moment we have Him captured. Only to discover Him anew in an even more unmanageable form. You know what this means to me? This means to me when I go see some friends downtown, when I check on some of our folks who are working in the workaday world, and I'm coming out of my little cloistered church life in, into the real world where you minister. It means to me when I pull up to Government Street and I look at the corner and I see the homeless person, there is the face of Christ. I can't stuff him back in the tomb. To redirect my life means you and I need to pay attention to the world around us. To everyone who suffers on the margin, there is the face of Christ. It means to recognize the grace that is Jesus and to redirect our life to show that grace. 
there are implications here. Until we get a new vision of Jesus, the one who rises from the tomb of our own darkness, until we get a new vision of Jesus, we cannot gain a new vision of life in Him. Until we get a new vision of Jesus, we cannot understand the power of Easter. We cannot stuff Him back in that tomb. It's the power of Easter that pulls us together this morning. This, this is a miracle. Arlen, as you said earlier, uh, my daughter Mariah is eight years old. And a lot of times she says, Dad, you keep on talking, but I can't tell what you're saying. So, Arlen, I don't know what a degree matters, but I'm one of those useless doctors. You know, I can't do surgery. And I figure that just helps no one. But the truth is, to me, I quest for this educational thing earlier in my life only to come to the sense of I need experience. I want to acknowledge and acquire the wisdom, and I want to just feed into the sense of the power of Jesus Christ, but I think you go about it sometimes because you're doing everything you can not to, not to come straight into the experience of the risen Christ. Because I, I can talk about Jesus, and I can read about Jesus, but sometimes I just need to speak to Jesus Christ. There's a sense where I just need the experience of the risen Christ. It is the power of Easter that pulls us together this morning, black and brown and white. It is the power of Jesus Christ that pulls us together, Church of God and Baptist and Methodist and Presbyterian, whatever shade we are. It is the power of Jesus Christ in the empty tomb. It's the power of Easter that pushes us into the world after our hallelujahs this morning, after our strong songs of faith. It is the power of Easter pulls us together. And it is the power of Easter that turns over in our life for Jesus. It is the power of Easter that, that turns Cemetery Mary into Ministering Mary. Preaching the Gospel, the good news of the risen Savior saying, I have seen the Lord, the experience of Christ. Tears of grief have turned to shouts of joy, and I wonder if the disciples will believe her now. We do you and I believe in the empty tomb? Yes. Do you and I believe Jesus died and rose again? Yeah. Do you and I believe he conquered death and defeated hell and pierced our darkness and sin and rocked the world by rising to life? Amen. If we believe these things, then we'll know. There's one more question that's even more important. It's a question this gospel story asks, I believe, a question that means Easter is more than, than doctrine, that Easter is more than words, and it's deeper than an ancient miracle dusted over now by decades and centuries of dust. The question is this. Have you and I encountered the living Savior? Have you and I experienced a turn around life in a run around world? Have you and I experienced the risen Christ? Because sisters and brothers, if we haven't, the empty tomb means absolutely nothing. The resurrection means absolutely nothing. The world has changed, you see. Everything has been turned around. That flicker at an empty tomb has changed to a full flyer of life for you and for me. From desperation to stillness, from chaos to peace, from sin to forgiveness, from darkness to light, from death to life, so that we can call out with the Apostle Paul, Death, where is your victory? And then we answer, Jesus turns you into a doorway of his life eternal. We call out, death, where is your sting? And we answer, Jesus overturns you by healing your pain. Jesus Christ is risen, brothers and sisters. Christ is risen and the angels rejoice. Christ is risen and new life reigns. If we're willing to slow down, to stop running around, we will hear Jesus call our name. But when we hear him, will we turn around? Will we?
Lord Jesus Christ, we seek an experience with you. We seek, Lord Jesus, to encounter you again this day. So, Lord, for the great glory of life over death and the forgiveness of sins, we are thankful, Jesus. We ask by your power, by the miracle of life that you've given us, move us again this day to encounter you face to face and to listen to turn fully to you as you call our name. And it is in the name of Jesus Christ, the risen Lord, we pray. Amen. We prepare to leave. It's a great gift then to join together. We've heard a wonderful song. We have the chance to sing together now. In this last movement, if you're able, please stand now as we sing. <coughs>